Okay. Hi, Dr. Stanley. How are you? Great, thanks. How are you? Good. Thank you for coming on the show. It's nice to have you here. Thanks for having me. Very happy to be here. And we're going to be talking about your book. You've got a book out called What's Hidden Inside Planets. Is that correct? That's right. So we're going to be talking about planet cores today. <laughs> yep, yeah. everything basically below the surface, beneath your feet. Okay, why is that important? So it turns out that the insides of planets, especially Earth, fundamentally determine the conditions on the surface of the planet. So when we think about why do we like living on the surface of the Earth, what makes it a nice place to be? It's stuff like liquid water in our oceans and rivers and lakes. It's a breathable atmosphere. All of those things are manifestations of processes that happen deep inside planets. So it's really important that we understand how those processes work so we make sure to keep the surface of the planet nice and livable. Well, my understanding is that the deeper you go into the Earth, the hotter it gets. So it would be pretty unlivable to be down uh, deep, deep in there, right? Yes, absolutely. As you go deeper into the Earth, the temperature rises and the pressure rises. So, for example, if you get about halfway down into the Earth at the top of the molten iron core, the temperatures are hotter than the surface of the sun, thousands of degrees, and the pressures are more than like a million atmospheres. So as if there were a million times Earth's atmosphere down there. So it's incredibly extreme environments. So even more so than deep diving in the ocean in terms of Absolutely. the pressure. Yeah. Um, I did see that Iceland is getting ready for a major eruption. Is that anything to do with the shifting or moving of the core in any way? Is there any significance so, to that? Yeah, great question. So places that are um, volcanoes like Iceland and other places on the Earth, they're essentially places where parts of the rocky part of the interior, the what we call the mantle, are coming close to the surface and erupting onto the surface. So it's not so much the iron core that's getting to the surface, but it's the other deep rocky parts of the planet coming up at uh, at Iceland. Iceland's also kind of a unique place because not only is it like a volcano, it's also a place where the tectonic plates are being pulled apart from each other. So there's even more volcanic activity happening from that. Why do we call the big gas ball planets planets? There's no actual land there, right? Like Saturn? You're absolutely right that there's no land there for us to kind of put our feet on, but they are still concentrations of material that make up giant spheres that orbit the sun. And essentially, that's our definition of planet. OK, and Jupiter is also a big ball of gas, isn't it? Yes, Jupiter is the biggest planet in our solar system. It's about 318 times the mass of Earth. So you could fit 318 Earth masses in there. Do you work for NASA? I work with NASA sometimes on certain projects. So uh, for example, I'm involved in a project that put a lander called the Mars Insight Lander on the surface of Mars. And on Mars, it's there to essentially measure quakes that happen, so Mars quakes that happen. And we can use those Mars quakes to figure out what the structure of Mars's interior is like. Who should read this book? Why, why is this important for average human beings to read? Yeah, great question. I think a lot of the times we're used to kind of staring up at the night sky and being filled with awe at the wonders and thinking about what's going on around those other stars and stuff. I think it's rare that we actually stare down at our feet and think about all the really cool processes that are happening thousands of miles below the surface. And it's really those processes that make the surface of the Earth uh, the place we like it to be. So it's really important that we understand what those processes are. So I hope to... Um, show people that are interested in figuring out what goes on if you take something like water or hydrogen or a rock and put it under extreme pressures and temperatures because you can get completely different behavior. Uh, if, for example, in some of the planets out there, we've got helium raining out of hydrogen in Jupiter and Saturn. We have iron snowing in the cores of Mercury and the moon Ganymede, which uh, orbits Jupiter. And we even have... Uh, diamond seas filled with diamond icebergs near the center of Uranus and Neptune. So lots of really cool things that we just don't have any experience with here on the surface of Earth. Is the uh, global warming slash climate change 
affecting the core of the Earth at all, or is it simply the atmosphere? Right. Global warming really affects the surface and the atmosphere. So it's really kind of, uh, we care, we're obviously going to care about that because that's what's going to affect what makes the surface of the Earth so nice to be. But it doesn't really have a big effect on the core, the deep interior of the Earth. Okay. Are we of any risk of the core suddenly exploding and having volcanoes pop up and erupt everywhere on this planet? We aren't at risk of that. The core is really kind of, it's stuck down there. It's the heaviest part of the Earth. It's going to stay down there. Uh, but the core is actually where Earth's magnetic field is generated. So if we want to think about things that might worry us, uh, we want the core to keep doing its thing, to keep trying to cool off and have these motions that go on in there, because those motions are responsible for generating the magnetic field that surrounds the Earth. It protects us from high energy particles that come from the sun uh, and from cosmic rays. Uh, so we really need that protective shield around us. So I think if we're we're worried about what's going to happen in the core, uh, we should be worried about it stopping doing the stuff that it's doing to help us keep our magnetic field. What about earthquakes? I, we hear when there are earthquakes that it's tectonic plates shifting, uh, San Andreas Fault. Is that fairly shallow in terms of the core? I mean, it's not that far down that that activity is happening. Yeah, that's kind of close to the surface. So several hundred kilometers, you can think of several hundred miles below the surface is the, the zone where the earthquakes on Earth happen. It's interesting because if you compare it to the moon, for example, we've actually detected moonquakes on the moon. And moonquakes can actually happen much deeper inside the moon, very close to the core of the moon. Uh, so it's interesting to see how quakes can manifest in different ways on different planetary bodies. Let me hit a couple of the talking points on your bio here. Some of these sound kind of interesting. Um, why does planet Earth appear to be the only planet that can sustain life? Yeah, great question. So the short answer is we don't know, but the longer answer is we think we understand some of the ingredients that are really important for life to have formed on Earth. For example, it's important that there was liquid water on the surface that was in contact with rock. It's important that we had um, the right chemistry around, right? The right elements around like hydrogen and carbon to make um, more complex and complex um, carbon molecules. And it's important that we had an energy source. So for example, um, sunlight, but also the heat that comes uh, from the deep interior of the earth at volcanic vents at the bottom of the ocean floor. We think that was very important for life to form on earth. So then you start looking out at other planets and you ask, well, which of the planets have those ingredients? And the answer is kind of not, none of the planets actually do. Probably our best bet for those sorts of conditions is some of the icy moons that surround the giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn. So for example, the moon Europa around Jupiter, we know that it has a global liquid water ocean about 10 miles below the surface. And so we also believe that there's an energy source down there. So maybe, Europa has the right ingredients for life there, and we need to go kind of look for life there. What's the surface temperature of the moons of Jupiter? So as soon as you get into the outer solar system, the answer is cold, right? I can't <laughs> give you the exact temperature, but really cold. Okay. <laughs> so uh, that's why the water on the surface is all frozen. And in fact, water in the outer solar system, whenever you find ice out there, it's like as hard as rock is on Earth here because it's so cold. That's why you have to go deeper into the bodies, into the moons, and then the temperatures are kind of the right range and the pressures are the right range where you can actually get liquid water. So conceivably humans could live on the moons of Jupiter underneath the underground. So the temperatures would be better there, but you still got to worry about a breathable atmosphere. There's no atmosphere down there, so that's a problem. Uh, but that might be a place where life of some other form has, has grown there. So it'd be interesting to see if there's any prospects or signs of life in the oceans of the icy moons. How likely do you think it's going to be that we will bring people to Mars in the distant, not too distant future? Uh, I think it's not very likely at all. And I'm sorry for everyone who kind of loves this idea of going to Mars. Uh, we think about, you know, you think about the things that we would need, atmosphere, food, water, and yeah, all of those, maybe you can come up ways, with ways to solve for them. But there's another big problem when it comes to long-term space travel. And that's the fact that when you're away from the Earth's magnetic field, you're no longer shielded from those high energy particles that bombard uh, the entire solar system. 
And so if we were out on a spacecraft heading to Mars, it might, it might take like six months to get there. Um, the likelihood of basically being radiated on your way out there is incredibly high. So we don't yet know how to solve that problem, and that's a major issue. The good news is we can still go out with robotic spacecraft to explore Mars and explore all the other planets, and there's so much that we can learn from this exploration that I think we should be focusing our efforts there. So probably in your lifetime and my lifetime, we're not going to see Star Trek and interplanetary travel on that kind of scale. I don't think so, unfortunately. Oh, that's too bad. I was looking forward to it. Uh, we've got just a couple of minutes. I want to, there's one more here. Uh, why is Venus an annoying planet? <laughs> Venus is the worst planet, I have to tell you. And it's, yes, it's a, a lovely, beautiful planet. Nothing against Venus. But as a planetary scientist, we've spent time to, figuring out all these really cool ways to study the insides of planets. And it works great for all planets except Venus. So that's why Venus is the worst. It's just really hard to study its interior. I'll give you a couple of examples. So for example, uh, on Earth, we've learned a lot about the interior from seismology, from tr following the waves that travel through the Earth after an earthquake and measuring them at the surface and learning about the interior structure that way. On Venus, we can't put a seismometer on the surface of the planet because the temperatures at the surface are so hot and the environment's so corrosive that nothing would survive. Then you ask, okay, well, maybe we can use um, magnetic fields. Like on Earth, we use the magnetic field to actually figure out what's going on in the core of the Earth. Well, Venus doesn't have a magnetic field, so we can't use that method either. And then you say, okay, well, maybe one method we use to figure out the interior structure is we use the planet's rotation. So Earth rotates, it's spinning, and because it's spinning, it's kind of bulgy at the center. And that size of that bulge actually tells us something about the structure of the interior. Then you go to Venus, and Venus is rotating so slowly that it has no bulge. So basically, all these methods that we've used that are really clever to figure out what goes on inside planets don't work at Venus, and that's very frustrating. So that's why planet, <laughs> the Venus is the worst planet. Is Pluto back on the list of an actual planet or not? So Pluto is not a planet, but it's even cooler. It was such a unique body that we decided we had to create an entirely new class of object for it. So I think Venus, uh, I think Pluto is actually um, even cooler than it would be if it had stayed a planet, right? It's now a dwarf planet. It's defined its own class of objects. It's kind of cutting its own path, its own trail. And so we should be happy that Pluto is this new type of object and no longer just another planet. Well, Dr. Stanley, I think we're going to have to wind this down. Thank you so much for coming on. The book is called What's Inside, oh, What's Hidden Inside Planets. Uh, is the book out now? Yes, the book is out. And actually with the discount code HPLAN, you can get 30% off the book at uh, press.jhu.edu. It's also available at your uh, local and online booksellers. Okay. You want to give out the website one more time, please? It's press.jhu.edu. Okay. Well, thank you for coming on the show. This was fun. And best of luck with the book and with your work. Thanks so much. Much appreciated.